Welcome to the 80s, 1980 to be more precise, the year marking the beginning of the decade-long war between Iraq and Iran that cost countless lives and achieved nothing. Also brought earthquakes in southern Italy that killed thousands of people, Mount St. Helens erupted, John Lennon was shot, and to make matters worse, CNN was launched starting the dreaded age of the 24-hour news channels. But not everything was doom and gloom. Tim Berners-Lee developed Enquire, a precursor to the World Wide Web that he would sell out 37 years later, which had a lot in common to the way that modern-day wikis function as opposed to how the web functions. The internet expanded with new possibilities thanks to the advent of Usenet, a distributed medium of communication where a lot of concepts of the modern-day internet were conceived, like flaming, spamming, and of course, online piracy. Commodore launched the VIC-20, the first computer to sell 1 million units, costing only $300 at the time. Tandy launched a color version of the TRS-80 and Science of Cambridge launched the ZX-80, the grandfather of the ZX Spectrum that would soon conquer Europe. And for those that wanted to get the most out of their home computers, Sugar Technology, now known as Seagate, released what is considered to be the first hard drive aimed at the home computing market, the ST506, that cost only $1,500 and had a capacity of around 5 megabytes. There were versions that went all the way up to 20 megabytes. They were not cheap. Moving to gaming, Nintendo released the Game & Watch, a combination between an actually useful digital alarm clock and a very simplistic LCD video game. During its run, it would sell over 40 million units and probably spawned a billion knockoffs way through the late 90s. The home gaming market was growing more each day, a computer version of Zork finally being available to the public at large in the form of Zork The Great Underground Empire Part 1. It was still the same game known from the PDP-10 with the text-only interface, but now you could play it in the comfort of your own home without a connection to a mainframe. But if you did have access to something like that, you had a new game at your disposal that aimed to combine the complexity of titles such as Moria and the various other games named Dungeon from the Age with a hint of emergence in the form of Rogue, the first Rogue. Rogue exploring the Dungeons of Doom created by Michael Toy and Glenn Witchman. It tasks you with traversing a randomly generated dungeon to retrieve the amulet of Yendor. Unlike previous games that at least tried to implement a graphics mode, Rogue embraced text, representing everything through Ashi characters, which meant there was a lot more room for making a sprawling, complex game with randomly generated levels, numerous creatures, items, and great longevity. Rogue's popularity would only increase with time, spawning the roguelike genre and numerous clones that haven't stopped appearing over the course of almost 40 years, aiming to improve, enhance, and reimagine the concept. On the arcade front, things were booming as they had been since people started moving away from just making Pong and created new and varied genres. One such new genre was the platformer, where you would play as a character that would run around platforms, traverse ladders, and do his best to avoid obstacles. That game was Universal Entertainment Corporation's Space Panic, credited as being the forerunner of the platformer genre, beating Donkey Kong to the punch by one year. It may be a bit obscure today, but in the 80s it was popular enough to receive numerous clones on all matter of systems. This was also the year when we got the first person tank combat game in the form of the original Battlezone, a wireframe rendered battlefield that you would navigate from the point of view of your own armored combat vehicle with the aim of making everything else blow up. Not just other tanks, but also the occasional UFO. Battlezone even had a version constructed for the army as a training system for the Bradley fighting vehicle to the protest of Ed Rothberg, one of the creators of the game. Atari would also create Missile Command, a game where you were tasked with protecting some blobs on the screen by shooting some lines that showed up from time to time. Though it seemed a bit abstract at first glance, because of the limited technology, they Thurber's creation was meant as a demonstration of what would happen to the west coast of the USA 
in the case that the Cold War went hot. As the player, you were tasked with shooting down incoming Soviet nuclear missiles, saving cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles from total destruction. Ferrer had stated that developing the game gave him nightmares about nuclear destruction, punctuated in the game by the replacement of a game over message with one that simply said, the end. Which is kind of funny when you think about the fact that the US government had a contingency plan to nuclear carpet bomb the entirety of Eastern Europe on its way to Moscow, killing millions intentionally by targeting population centers, not just military stuff. But the biggest arcade game of 1980 and the game of the year, though we shouldn't look over the importance of Rogue as well, was Pac-Man. Namco's monster hit and progenitor of a new generation of video games. Pac-Man was the first true mascot-driven game. One where the main character was as much a focus as the gameplay. It gave people something to identify with, someone to identify with, if you can consider Pac-Man as being a someone. A true symbol of the 80s and a simple enough game that it sold more than 300,000 arcade cabinets worldwide legally and according to the information on the web there were at least as many unauthorized units running Pac-Man floating around by the end of the decade. It was a game so popular that even the worst possible port of it, the one for the Atari 2600, still became a best seller shipping over 7 million units. Pac-Man was one of those titles that managed to shove video games in the global culture, to the point where it became something that people People instantly identify with video games, reaching the same level, maybe even higher, than Pong or Space Invaders. It wouldn't be long before it spread to other mediums, with a board game and even its own animated TV series produced by Hanna-Barbera, and all based on the appeal of a yellow circle with a mouth that went waka 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 waka, munching pills, eating a cherry now and again, and running away or eating ghosts. It was clear that the idea of the mascot had a lot of traction, and in 1981, we will get a lot more of them. Goodbye.